Avril. There we go. Okay, so um, we left off uh, last week, if you remember, speaking about Chalitza. Uh, and I showed you that uh, amazing video uh, of the uh, Chalitza ceremony that took place in Iran um, uh, earlier, well, last year it is now, in, in 2020. Um, Ashkenaz ceremony. Well, it was certainly uh, a ceremony which was based on the psukim because you could see that uh, he actually said the psukim. Um, and um, I'm not. How do you know it's Ashkenaz, Marcel? Because he says S. He, okay, he, so he probably so, couldn't read Hebrew, and he was probably saying it what, he, what the Rav told him. That the yeah, pro told that's him. probably right. Um, uh, the, the pronunciation was Ashkenaz, but I, I suspect that the the ceremony um, is going to be very similar uh, across the board because it's the ceremony which is prescribed um, in the Torah itself. Um, so, uh, and, and what was so fascinating to me to see was how faithful. Uh, the ceremony was to the psukim that we uh, we read. So how did we get onto that? We got onto that um, from this piece of Gomorrah. Let me share the screen and see if I can share the right screen. It would help, wouldn't it? Um, there we go. Can you see the right screen? Um, yeah, good. Okay. So um, we we got onto that because of this piece of Gomorrah here. Um, Rav Huna, ki hava nafek ledina amahachi. Rav Huna, when he would go out to judgment, he would say, "Afiku li mane chanute." Take these uh, um, tools of mine out of my shop. And what were his tools? Makel urutsua v'shufra v'sandala. A stick, a strap, a, a shofar, and a shoe. And we spoke about the strap and we uh, had a nice little reminisce about uh, Rebbe Balkin. Uh, and and uh, some of us admitted or didn't admit to having received it um, uh, in, in the past. Uh, and then we spoke about the sandal, which was the shoe. And that was the special Chalitza shoe. So that's how we got on to Chalitza last week. Let's carry on uh, and or I suppose in a way go back a few words. Um, and talk about the other things. We mentioned the shofar, uh, that that was used to uh, um, announce a cheyrem, an excommunication, somebody who was put in cheyrem, somebody who was uh, excommunicated from the community, either uh, permanently or temporarily. Um, that would be announced by using this shofar. And that leaves the strap and the stick. And we, very me we mentioned very briefly uh, last time um, that the, here there were two different um, um, instruments, really, two different instruments of uh, a punishment, the stick and the strap. Uh, and I just want to spend uh, uh, just a couple of minutes going through uh, that, because uh, the, the, the question is, um, why is there a stick and a strap? So first of all, let's just talk about um, uh, I'm just going to stop the share for a second. Um, let's just talk about the um, idea of corporal punishment uh, in the Torah, or corporal punishment altogether, really. Um, I think that, that most people would consider uh, the modern generations to be uh, enlightened and liberal, um, and the, the thought of uh, corporal punishment, flogging, flagellation, lashes, whatever you want to call it, uh, is a bit, it's a bit horrific really to us. Uh, and it's a bit, I suppose, a bit like uh, the idea of idol worship. For us, I mean, it's a bit bonkers, isn't it? The idea of bowing down to a piece of stone or a carved piece of wood. We can't really relate to that. And um, um, for us, the idea today of uh, public flagellation, flogging, lashes uh, given out to, uh, <coughs> to <laughs> lawbreakers, it's not something that we're really comfortable with. Um, does anybody know, by the way, when corporal punishment 
I'm not talking about in schools, I'm talking about corporal punishment from the courts. Does anybody know when corporal punishment was banned in the United Kingdom? What year was it banned? Come on, have a guess. 1960. I'll guess 1932. We've got 1960. We've got 1932. What else? 1970. 1970. Any other offers? Howard? Victoria, Jane. It's only still allowed. 1932. 1932. Okay, no the, answer, the answer, folks, is 19, 1946. 1946. That's when uh, corporal punishment was, was uh, banned in the UK. However, however, um, I, um, I am sure that uh, all of you from the UK um, uh, will, if not having received it yourself, will have uh, known somebody who got the cane at school sometime after 1946. So uh, uh, we have to just answer another question. When was corporal punishment, the cane, or any other kind of corporal punishment in schools, when was that banned in the UK? Any offers? I'll go back to 1970. 1962. 1962, 1970. 1960. 1960. Well, I can, I can tell you from my own experience, not that uh, I ever got the cane. Uh, 65. I can tell you from my own experience, it was much later than that, because I was born in 1959, and the cane was still being given out at school when I went. The answer, amazingly... 1986, 1986, uh, um, the, um, the cane was still given out, or it was still legal to give the cane in the UK till 1986. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? Um, anyway, why am I telling you all that? Because the idea um, just, well, if 1946 is what, 70-odd years ago, 70-odd uh, years ago, uh, in the UK, and I suspect probably similar in the US, I don't know, I didn't look it up, um, but 70 odd years ago in the, in the UK, certainly 100 years in the UK, uh, corporal punishment was normal. It was part of the, the, the punishments available to the courts. So uh, although we think it's a bit horrific and barbaric and, uh, and uh, uh, ancient, it's not that ancient at all. And, and the reason I wanted to mention this is because it's a bit like the Korbanot. We find the idea of animal sacrifice difficult to, to, to grasp. The Torah talks about animal um, sacrifice and it also talks about corporal punishment because that is what was going on at the time. And um, uh, I know that David Marks is, is uh, uh, very uh, hot on this topic. The book that he uh, kindly bought for me goes into this in some detail, the book by Joshua Berman called Ani Maimin, which I am uh, manfully working my way through on a Shabbat afternoon, talks about the idea of the historical context of the Torah and how important the historical context of the Torah is. Uh, because the Torah, although it is of course for all generations, it, when it was first given, it had to be relevant to that generation. But otherwise, uh, it wouldn't work. For example, uh, it would be, you couldn't possibly start talking to somebody from even 200 years ago about, uh, about cars or about plane travel. It just wasn't in their, uh, in, in their uh, whole concept of, of, uh, of, of, of their mindset. They couldn't get their head around that. So when the Torah was given, uh, it had to be given in the historical context. In other words, uh, if you look at the ideas of corporal punishment in the Torah, which we're going to do in a minute, you will see that actually they were very liberal for the time. There was a, they had to be a, a doctor on hand to make sure that this person was fit to have the punishment and how many lashes he was able to uh, uh, su survive and, and, and put up with. Um, and then there were the various different ideas about uh, uh, who would get the, the uh, lashes and the, 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 the idea that witnesses had to be there to, to make sure that it wasn't done excessively, etc, etc. So um, I, I just wanted to put into context 
the, uh, and I suppose debunk right from the start, the concept that uh, the Torah is barbaric uh, and ancient and uh, not relevant to today. Um, one has to understand the historical context uh, of the Torah. It's absolutely vital. You cannot understand Gemara or even the Torah itself uh, without realizing that the Torah has a historical context and it has to be uh, understood in the historical context of the time. Uh, Howard, what would you like to uh, add? Can I, can I just ask, Johnny, I know it wasn't applied very often, but there was a death penalty. There was stoning to death. And I just wonder when that was abolished um, from a halachic or Jewish point of view. Okay, good question. Um, first of all, on, on um, capital punishment, which we will come to later on in Gemara Sanhedrin in about 25 years. Uh, so, uh, but just briefly, yes, uh, there are, uh, there is uh, capital punishment uh, is um, accounted for in the Torah. Uh, the Gemara tells us that any bet din that put to death one person in 70 years was considered cruel. And therefore, uh, what they're telling us is that it never really happened. And, and you can see when you go through Gemara Sanhedrin, as we go in, as, uh, in, in uh, later uh, chapters, we'll see that very much of the workings of the Bet Din in all um, um, criminal cases, if you like, they were working towards trying to acquit the uh, defendant. It's almost as if they're bending over backwards to acquit the defendant. We mentioned this this before, for example, the Ben Sore or More, the, uh, the gluttonous son, which we read about in Parashat Kitetse. Uh, if you have this gluttonous son, you have to bring him before the Bet Din and the Bet Din take him out uh, and he gets stoned in front of all the people. It never happened. It could never happen. And the reason it could never happen was because the rabbis interpret the psukim in such a way as to show that it could never happen. For example, it says in the pasuk that the, uh, this uh, recalcitrant son doesn't listen to the voice of his father and his mother. From that pasuk, the, the rabbis learn that the father's voice and the mother's voice have to be identical. Now, uh, on, a, on a sort of uh, non-literal uh, um, uh, level, that means that there have to be, as we say, speaking from the same hymn sheet. But the rabbis interpret that literally to mean that the voice of the mother and the voice of the father have to be identical. They have to be identical in pitch, in tone, etc., in words, which, of course, is impossible. No two people have exactly the same voice. And so therefore, the rabbis say this never happened. They never put a, a Ben Sorer or Moret to death. The whole thing is there just to teach us a, uh, uh, lessons. Um, uh, we don't need to go into that now, but it's just an, uh, an example to show you that, yes, Howard, there were, um, there were uh, capital punishment was allowed for in the Torah. It was very rare. Um, and the uh, rabbis on the Bate dinner uh, of the all generations um, tried very hard to avoid uh, getting into that situation. Uh, and my reading around this earlier today and last night um, I, I read um, something that, that indicated that at some time during the uh, Second Temple period, uh, capital punishment was no longer uh, handed out at all uh, by the Bate Din. Uh, I, I'd need to just confirm that because I was reading about something else and it just came along. But I think that's correct. Yes, David, are you going to... Uh, yeah, well, one, of the, one, of the reasons, one of the reasons why it was abandoned is because under Roman rule, they never had the authority to, to uh, issue a capital that's punishment. That's right. That's right. I that's exactly what I read. So that uh, would be sometime during the... Uh, in, in, in 25 years' time, we'll get to a very, very fascinating Gomorrah in Sanhedrin about uh, the, the death of uh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have to hang on, folk, to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, Larry. Excuse me. Corporal punishment is still allowed in the United States. It was last, I think, in the late 70s, a Supreme Court ruling said that states could choose to use it. And I think about 19 states, mostly in the South, still permit it. That's interesting. And, and, and does, it still, does it still get carried out, Larry? I believe it does. I haven't been in high school for a long time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that woman was executed last week. 
Yeah, no, that's different, Marcel. We're talking about corporal punishment as opposed oh, to capital oh, punishment. That's very interesting. Thank you for that, Larry. Um, yeah. By the way, um, I don't know. Uh, I may be I may be speaking the, the, the blindingly obvious to some of you here, um, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it's only very recently that I understood that the penny dropped what the word corporal punishment meant. Um, I always thought that it was given out by a corporal in the uh, in the army. Uh, and of course, that's nonsense. And it, the penny only dropped fairly recently for me. Corporal punishment, the expression comes from the word corpus, which of course means body. So corporal punishment is punishment on your body. Uh, not that, uh, see, Johnny Houghton didn't know that, did you? No, there you go. So I'm not the only dummy around here. Sorry, Johnny, I didn't mean to call you a dummy. But I, I only, I only sort of the penny only dropped for me there fairly recently on that. So I thought I would share with you. Corporal punishment comes from the word corpus body. Anyway, let's get back to our, uh, let's get back to uh, our Gomorrah. Uh, let me uh, just show you. What's capital uh, punishment then? Is that for you knocking your head off? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's exactly right, Johnny. Yeah, oh, capitus is the head. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right, let me show you this. Uh, let me sh show you this if I can. Hang on. Um, no, not that. Let me show you this. Can you see those pictures on the screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Well, those pictures. Um, where are you? I've lost you. There you go. Those pictures are. Uh, if you go, just go into uh, Google and put in biblical flogging implements. You can see that at the top of the screen there. This is what you get up. And I was hoping that we would see uh, a picture of, um, of the strap that was used to give uh, uh, punishment uh, in the Torah. But it, I don't see one. What you can see here are all these sort of cat and nine tails uh, things. Uh, whips and there's a Roman scourge over there. There's a picture here of the flagellation of Jesus um, and a, a few more of them there uh, involving the punishment of Jesus. So perhaps we ought to get rid of this uh, uh, right now. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, I didn't find a picture of the, uh, the, the strap that we referred to in our Gemara. Now, how do I know that? Because, let me get rid of that. Uh, and share something else with you, uh, because there is a Gemara in Makot 22b, uh, which I will share with you now. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. Can you see that? Yeah. So there's the Gemara in, in Makot, um, which uh, speaks about the, uh, um, the strap that we're going to talk about here. Um, let's see if I can find it exactly where it is on the here. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Um, so it's a Mishnah in Makot 22b. Uh, and on the screen, you can see the, uh, the Mishnah here. I'm just going to read the English. Uh, the, the, the first part, half of the Mishnah is how it was done. And then... Um, and, and this uh, answers your question. Um, I can't remember who asked me the question. Somebody asked me the question last week, whether it was the judges themselves who gave out the uh, punishment uh, or whether it was a, uh, a somebody doing, the, doing it on their behalf. Uh, and I said that I thought it was somebody on their behalf. And here is the proof of that in this Mishnah. The attendant of the congregation um, stands on it um, with a strap in his hand, okay? He's got a strap in his hand. It's a strap of calf hide, and it's doubled. One into two, two into four, and two straps of don donkey hide go up and down the doubled strap of the calf hide. The length of its handle is one hand breadth, and the width of it is one hand breadth, and the strap must be long enough so that its end reaches the top of his abdomen i.e. his navel when he's flogged from behind. So we don't need to go into the, uh, uh, the details of how this was done right now. We can do that when we learn Gemara Makot uh, in uh, 150 years time. Uh, but suffice it to say that we know that this strap was a doubled over strap made of leather. 
not the pictures that I just showed you with all the cat and nine tails, with all the uh, flagellation things. That's not what was used. That was the strap. Let's go back to our uh, Gemara uh, and uh, have a look at what the Gemara is talking about. Let's go back to the Gemara, Sanhedrin. There we are. Um, so the Gemara tells us that uh, the were well, a strap, the Ritsua, and the Makel, the rod. So we know what the Ritsua was. The Ritsua was that strap that we've just read about in, in Makot. What about the stick? What was this stick for? Somebody said last week that it was to uh, prod the litigants into uh, behavior. I think that was you, Leon, wasn't it, that, that said that, that uh, uh, it might have been used to prod them into uh, behaving properly. No, I, I was uh, the one who, who asked whether the judges carried out. Oh, the right. OK. <laughs> well, I, I think your question was a very good question, actually, because you will see when um, uh, if you, when you look in the Torah itself, it actually, the Torah actually says that the Shofet does the punishment, the judge does the punishment. But I think, as we spoke about and as it says in the Mishnah, it's delegated. Um, anyway, this this a stick. Um, Rob Steinsal says, excuse me, Johnny, interrupting, says that one explanation of the rod is just to threaten them, the obstinate uh, litigant. Correct. That, that's one idea. The other... So, Johnny, I, I seem to remember that in Mishnah Torah, it said that the witnesses inflict the punishment. The witnesses in, uh, um, inflict the punishment when you have uh, Adim Zomamim, when you have uh, false witnesses um, who uh, tried to incriminate somebody else, and it turns out that they uh, they themselves were uh, they, they, they they themselves. Is that what you're you're referring to? No, no, I don't think so. There was a, a lot about it, 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 it's in Sanhedrin in in in, in Mishnah Torah, and I'll try and get back and look at it in the next day or so. No, I, I think I think what you're saying is right, Marcel. When there's a capital case, those who are the witnesses against the capital cases, it says Yad Rishona Bo. They are the first ones to uh, administer uh, the punishment. Uh, but that's not talking about Makkot, talking about flagellation. That's, that's talking about capital punishment, where somebody has, has their, their evidence mm -hmm. has caused them to be, uh, um, 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 what's the word, convicted of a capital crime, it's, it's in some ways a discouragement for people to come and give evidence against somebody that's gonna cause a capital punishment because they're gonna be the ones that has to do it. Yad uh, bo is the expression. When they Their hands them, should be on him first. They wrapped around their neck and choked them. Well, that was one, one of the punishments. There are four different types of uh, capital punishment, but we'll come to that in due course. Okay. So the, to go back to our rod here, our stick, um, there, there appears there are two types of uh, lashes, two types of <coughs> um, flagellation. There is the flagellation which is um, spoken about in the Torah for for uh, any punishment for uh, for a Torah law, and then there's something called uh, uh, Malkut Maradot, which is a uh, a rabbinically uh, um, um, a rabbinically originated. Uh, lashes. These, the rabbis were given perm permission, were, or gave themselves permission, I suppose, um, to hand out punishments of lashes which were not uh, um, prescri prescribed in the Torah itself uh, in terms of keeping discipline. In other words, they, uh, they were able to use it as a deterrent or as a punishment uh, or as a coercion for people to, um, to uh, keep the laws. I'm gonna share something else with you now, uh, which, is, uh, um, which I found. Let me just see if I can find it again. Here it is. Uh, you never get a frat from Rabbi Zilberger, Johnny. No, I didn't, and it was never in his shear. Oh, I did. <laughs> Here we go. This is what I wanted to share with you. Frightened, a frask. No, I, I, I was, I was never, in, I was never in his shear. I, I went straight from Rabbi Magulis into um, uh, Rep, Herschel. Rep Herschel's. Oh. Okay. Uh, can you see this screen here with some lots of writing on it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
All right, let me show you what it says here. So here, uh, disciplinary floggings. Uh, there are reports in the Talmud of several extra legal floggings being prescribed. For example, for having marital intercourse in public in Uvomus 90b, in many cases, the flogging appears to have been sanctioned as a legal punishment, even though not falling within the categories set out above. For example, where a man and woman seclude themselves or for taking unreasonable vows. Um, so uh, these disciplinary floggings, makat mardut as it's called, was an innovation of the Talmudic jurists. And it seems that these um, uh, extra legal floggings, if you like, floggings that were not prescribed by the Torah itself, these were done using the stick as opposed to using the strap. Um, and um, that seems to be the that seems to be the district distinction uh, over here. Uh, I think it says it even down here. Um, uh, uh, here, the argument that such discretionary floggings constitute a much severer punishment for many much lighter offences than the biblical flogging was countered with the assertion that the execution of the flogging should be so humane as to counterbalance to the increased measure of the strokes. Indeed, it appears that the lashes were not normally inflicted on the bare body, nor with a leather whip, nor on the breast or back, but rather on less vulnerable parts. And it, it wasn't used, the leather whip wasn't used. Instead, this stick was used, I suppose, something like a cane. Uh, anyway, so um, to go back to uh, the Gemara, um, which we'll do now, um, the, the uh, tools of the trade, uh, that uh, Rav Huna speaks about uh, are the uh, stick, which we've now established was used for extra legal uh, uh, beatings, as opposed to the strap, which was used for uh, Torah uh, violations, the uh, shofar for excommunication, and the uh, sandal, the shoe of chalitza. So Rav Huna, when he went out, he would take out these tools of the trade and he would have them there uh, in front of him. Um, so I think now that we, we've said that, we understand uh, that how much we've managed to learn from those four words. We've managed to learn uh, how Chalitza works, how Cherem was announced, uh, what the uh, weapons uh, were or the, the, the methods of punishment were for both Torah laws and uh, Makat uh, Mardut, the uh, um, disciplinary uh, floggings. So uh, again, by, by going slowly and deliberately, uh, we've learned a great deal about the workings of the Bet Din, the workings of the ancient uh, Talmudic world. Um, and now we can, uh, we can move that on. Yes, I think somebody's got their hand up. Nachum. In the last screen that was brown, did you see that it said notables no, yeah, notables were exempt from flogging. Did you see okay. that? I did see that. And you there is, or... there was a, there was a, a concept, you well spotted there, Nachum. There was a concept, not in the uh, Torah uh, floggings, but in the disciplinary floggings. Um, there was sometimes, not always, but there was sometimes an option uh, to avoid the flogging by paying a fine. In other words, you were given, and I think that happens today, really. You can either go to prison or you can pay a fine uh, in certain, for certain crimes. And um, so the notables who, who got out of it would basically pay their way out of it. They would pay a fine instead of having uh, their lashes. Uh, Nebuch, the poor people who, who couldn't uh, uh, pay their way out of it, they had to take their punishment uh, bodily. But yeah, that, that's, that, that was how it worked in those days. Uh, um, Nachum, uh, if you had money, uh, you could uh, buy your way out of it. Uh, plus ça change, as I would say, uh, as they would say. Yes, Johnny? Uh, it says in the Rabbi Stan's house, interesting, according to another explanation, the judge is exhorted to be vigilant, not to conduct himself in such a way that he himself will be deserving of lashes. Yeah, that, no, that was interesting. That, that, that fits in with the previous Gemaras that we were yeah. talking about a couple of weeks ago about humility. You remember the Gemaras we were talking about, about how the judges would say various psukim to keep themselves from becoming mm. haughty. Um, 
the, the uh, Rav Steinzalt's explanation that Johnny's just told us uh, fits in with that because they would have these things on their on their desk, as it as it were, uh, as a reminder that if they did something wrong themselves, they also would be subject to the punishment uh, with these uh, with these implements. So, uh, so yeah, that 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 fits yeah. in with our, our previous Gemara. Johnny. Yes, Stephen. Johnny. Makat um, Maradut, we say that in the Al Khatoim on Yom Kippur. We do, we do, absolutely. We, uh, we ask for um, at the end of the Al Khaits, uh, we yeah. have uh, a list of all the sins um, for which we <coughs> are asking forgiveness. And included in that are sins that we are, are, are uh, ob obligated with capital punishment sins that were are obligated with a corporal punishment and one of those things you're quite right Steve, I, i'd forgotten that quite right it mentions there uh, the uh, makat maradut those sins that we would be obligated to suffer the uh, disciplinary floggings makat maradut thank you mm. for pointing that okay. out next time we say the al khaits uh, on yom kippur um, we can have in mind uh, those pictures of those okay. nasty uh, uh, flagellation tools. It might make us uh, concentrate our minds on our video a little bit stronger. Thank you for that, Stephen. Okay, so um, let's move on. Um, and we're going to talk now uh, within the Gemara. Have you got the Gemara on the screen there? Yeah. Okay, so the Gemara now is going to talk about um, some Psukim. Um, it's going to really uh, go to town in dissecting uh, um, two or three psukim in uh, Dvarim, which talks about uh, how judges should behave. And this is Moshe Rabbeinu uh, telling the Bnei Yisrael what he told the judges right at the time after Matan Torah, when the judges were first uh, um, appointed. Uh, this is Moshe Rabbeinu recapping for the next generation what he told the judges at that time. Let me, first of all, before we look at the Gemara, let me first of all uh, share with you the Psukim themselves. Uh, and um, we'll get Leon to read them out. They're from uh, Dvarim uh, and they are chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. Uh, and let me just get those up on the screen. Hopefully you've got them there uh, now on the screen. Um, OK, Leon, you know which verses they are. Verses 16 to 18. This is yeah. uh, Moshe Rabbeinu speaking through Leon's voice. I instructed your judges at that time saying, listen among your brethren and judge righteously between a man and his brother or his litigant. You shall not show favoritism in judgment. Small and great alike shall you hear. You shall not tremble before any man, for the judgment is God's. Any matter that is too difficult for you, you shall bring to me and I shall hear it. I commanded you at that time all the things that you should do. Okay, so um, there's Moshe Rabbeinu recapping and, uh, and, and really, uh, you can understand why the Gemara is going to go to town on these two psukim, because there's lots of information in there that Moshe is telling the judges. Uh, you could just skim over it and say, well, he's just telling them to do a proper job. It's obvious. But the Gemara doesn't, doesn't like that. The Gemara, of course, is going to look at every word of these psukim. Uh, and he's going to darshan out, he's going to uh, explain and learn from every uh, word of these psukim how judges have to conduct themselves. So let's go back to the uh, Gemara. Uh, are you seeing the Gemara on the screen there or not? Yes? No, you're not. Okay. I'll have to unshare and then reshare. Um, how about now? You got it now? Yeah, okay. So the Gemara uh, uh, quotes the beginning of the Pasuk. 
va'atzaveh et shoftechem ba'et hahi. Uh, and I commanded your judges at that time. Um, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said, Keneged makel uretsua tehe zariz. With regard to the stick and the strap, you should be very careful. Zariz should be vigilant, careful. Um, and of course, you can see the connection why this pasuk has suddenly been brought here, because Rabbi Yochanan is talking about the makel uretsua, the rod and the strap. Let me just go a little bit further up. The previous few words in the Gemara was makel uretsua. So you can see the connection why they brought this pasuk all of a sudden. And Rabbi Yochanan brings this pasuk and says, this is. Uh, um, this is telling us you have to be very careful. And why is that? Uh, and the reason is because of this word, va'atzaveh. And I, he translates it here as I charged you. Uh, how does uh, um, um, Art Scroll translate it, Leon? I commanded you. I commanded you. Um, uh, so uh, from the word mitzvah, you can see mitzvah in there, atzaveh. The, the same root as the word mitzvah, I commanded your judges. And uh, the Gemara tells us that whenever uh, the word atzaveh, the word sav, command, that means it's something you have to be very careful about. Yes, Leon? The, uh, in the Gemara, it's commanded, but in the Chumash, also art scroll, I instructed your judges. Okay, that's very interesting uh, that the two different art scrolls uh, translate it differently. I instructed or I commanded. Um, now, perhaps... Sonsino is... said charged as well. Sorry? Sonsino say charged. Charged, okay. And, and uh, Steinzel says charged as well. Um, now, maybe this is a good example of what we call confirmational bias. But, uh, but it's my view, uh, hang on, sorry about that. It's my view that the word commanded, or even the word charged, um, is, uh, is used, uh, means a stronger thing than the word instructed. Does anybody agree or disagree with that? that commanded sounds to me more powerful than instructed, or am I just being confirmationally biased here? Here's way, Johnny, no. again. Rob Steinsell says, Rob Steinsell says, understanding that the word charge indicates alacrity. I don't know what that means. Speed. Yeah, and I see it, I see it somewhat differently. I actually think alacrity. charge is a very good combination of, uh, a mitzvah, which is you know the, the authority of God, and instruction, which is the passing on from one person to another. This is this is almost a um, what a combination. I the word is missing, but I think charged is good, and I think whenever we use the word mitzvah, we should consider its meaning compared to all these other gradations of translation. <laughs> Okay, so, so uh, in this uh, word, we're arguing about translations. That's all. the The essential word is the Hebrew word. You're right, yeah. Howard. You're you're and the Hebrew right. word is command. Okay. And I will command your judges at that time. At that okay. time. Okay. The command so, so, is much different than being in a, than a charge. You you tell yeah. me all of, yeah. all of God tells us is commandments. Yeah. He doesn't say I'm charging you. He says, I'm commanding you, do it and this way, this is a command. God, what's also. stronger? In, in this law dictionary, it says, judge's instruction to a jury is a charge. Okay, now so, let me, wait. let me, um, let me, um, let me agree, first of all, uh, uh, with, uh, with Howard, that, that actually, uh, we are arguing over different translations. Now, we have to do that, though, Howard, because um, Hebrew is not our 
uh, mother tongue. And uh, biblical Hebrew is certainly not our mother tongue. And therefore, the only way that we can really understand the nuance is to try and get the translation as best we can in our mother tongue. One sec before you interrupt me. Let me just finish. Uh, and so uh, whilst you're right, the important word is at saver. We, what I'm trying to do now is to uh, uh, explain what the Gemara is doing. The Gemara is saying to us that this word at saver has connotations that we must understand. And the connotation that it wants to put over to us is that this is an imperative. It's something that we have to be zariz, we have to be careful about. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so the, the Gemara is telling us that when you translate the word at saver, however you translate it, whether you translate it as command or charge or instruct, have in mind that what the Torah means by atzaver, what the Hebrew word means, is that it is something you must be very careful about. Now, we have here with us, uh, uh, we have uh, four different uh, um, nationalities of English, if you like. We've got English English, we've got American English with uh, Larry uh, uh, and Sharon, we've got South African English with Morris and Mervyn, and we've got Israeli English with Nahama. And of course, the rest of us have got English English. And, so, and we've got Mancunian English. And we've got, and we've got Southern Cockney nonsense as well. Um, so, uh, and we've even got Scouse. And that, I'm not even sure that's English at all. But anyway, let's not, <laughs> let's, not, let's, not, let's, let's not go there. But what the point uh, I'm making uh, is that, that uh, a translation, and this is what Howard is saying, a translation can never do justice to the original word. And that is exactly why the Gemara is telling us that, that whenever this word sav command is used, we need to, our ears need to prick up and we need to understand that this is something about which we must be very careful. And that is what Rabbi Yochanan is pointing out here. He says, He's asking a question. He's saying, Atzaver means I have to be careful about something. What is it that this Pasuk is telling me I must be careful about? And he's explaining what you must be careful about is the strap and the rod. In other words, uh, Rabbi Yochanan is saying, be careful. You know, you, you, this is not something that you can be... Um, uh, cavalier or, or, or casual about. It's something you must be zariz, something you must be vigilant <coughs> about. Yes, Howard, do you want to do you want to come back on that or have uh, we dealt with that? I, now? I think no, I think Sharon Sharon's explanation is a very important one. But also we must remember that Hebrew didn't develop for 2,000 years. Yiddish is a very rich language. Uh, there are far more synonyms in uh, English than there are in Hebrew. And all we're arguing about is the difference between charged, instructed, and commanded. And the reality is there's no difference between any of them. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I accept your point. Uh, it, I suppose it was my fault because I said I thought that um, commanded and charged were, were more forceful than instructed. But it's irrelevant. Uh, some people may, may disagree with that. And we're talking, as you said, we're talking about translation. The point that I wanted to get over... Uh, was that uh, when we see the word sav in any of our uh, readings, we have to bear in mind that this is the, the rabbis are telling us stop, this is a red light. You've muted yourself, Johnny. He's frozen. I think you've frozen, Johnny. He's got an internet problem. You're frozen, Johnny. You need charging up again. <laughs> <laughs> Had to leave and rejoin. Mm -hmm. send him no. the you to put it right. Do you think mm -hmm. the proper do you think the proper word is frozen? Do we have a definition of whether whether he's really <laughs> frozen or not? Because very cold. I'm not, I'm not sure. 
I, I'm not sure he's really frozen. I mean, let's let's he is, be he's very tough. He's very let's, tough. let's say <laughs> he is in a, a, a suspended animation. He's not now. He's left. <laughs> He'll come back. He'll come back. What do you mean? Maybe he's right. How do you know whether he's left or right? Oh, no, I think I know his politics. Oh, politics. you don't know. You just think you know. All oh, right. Yeah, of course. We don't don't give up that easily. Don't give up that easily. My goodness. Well, no. So can we continue to read this? Or no, we don't have back. to read um, we're back. Are you you back? mean he's re you mean he's returned? No, he's <laughs> muted. You're muted, Johnny. My internet went down there. Don't know why. Sorry about yeah. that. Uh, anyway, uh, we're back. Um, okay. So where was I? Did anybody remind me where I was? You you were frozen. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, anyway, oh. let's carry on. Uh, I don't know what I was talking about there. Because... You were talking about translations not being, being charged, don't know. No, we left that. We? We're done with translations. Right, but let's carry on. So, uh, the, the John, upstairs... John, Johnny, Johnny, yes. so just uh, to clear this up, just ask Leon to read note 40 in the Art Scroll Gomorrah. Leon, are you with us? Yes, I'll, I'll do that if you want. Yes, please. A Bariah said, well. uh, quoted in Kiddushin 29a states, every place in scripture that the term Sav, command, is stated, it is nothing but an indication that the scripture's command should be carried out with meticulousness. In our context, the use of this term, the at Saveh, and I commanded, indicates that a judge should be ready to use the stick and strap for the sake of heaven whenever the need arises. That's Rashi. But he should at the same time be careful not to impose an excessive fear of the courts. Okay, so that is the, the bit that I was coming to next. You stole my thunder there, David. Thank you. Um, oh, it, it, it was explaining that, Saver. Yes. So that's, of course, the, the source of what I said before, that whenever it says at Saver, yeah. uh, it is uh, uh, something that has to be done with alacrity. Um, and, and of course, I didn't make it up. It's from a Brysa in Kiddushin. Now, what is Rabbi Yochanan saying? When Rabbi Yochanan says you have to uh, use this makel and uh, um, carefully, be vigilant with it, uh, there are two opinions. There's one opinion, and that's the opinion uh, uh, quoted in this uh, in this note of Rashi, that uh, if it needs to be done, then it needs to be done. In other words, Rashi is saying, don't be scared to use this punishment if you have to, because it is a mitzvah to do so. Tosfus, on the other hand, says, hang on a minute, be careful. Don't overuse it, because if you overuse it, and you use it uh, um, uh, with, with uh, wh where perhaps uh, you could avoid using it, then you're going to have a regime of fear, uh, which you want to try and avoid. So it, it's very interesting. Rabbi Yochanan, in some ways, um, makes it more difficult to understand than less difficult, because he doesn't actually clearly say what he means by being zariz. Uh, and as you can see, Rashi and Tosfot, which... Uh, uh, often disagree with one another, take uh, almost polar opposite views of what he was referring to. Okay, uh, let's move on. And they then um, take the next bit of the Pasuk. Um, and the next bit of the Pasuk says, Shamoa bein achechem ushfatetem. Let's see if we could go back to the uh, Pasuk. Uh, and get the pasuk on the screen again. Uh, there it is. Let me share that with you. Okay, have we got the pasuk on the screen? Yeah, okay. So, um, the verse says, uh, off you go, Leon, verse 16 again. I instructed your judges at that time, saying, listen among your brethren and judge righteously between a man and his brother or his litigant. Okay, so the next bit of the Gemara is going to uh, uh, dissect 
the next few words, Shamoa uh, Bain uh, uh, listen or hear disputes, as it says on the screen here, between your brothers. And then we're going to go on uh, in, next time, probably, Ushpataten Tzedek, and uh, just and, and judge with Tzedek, whatever that means, we'll learn. Bain Ishu Bain Achiv between a man and his brother, Uvein Geiro. And uh, we all know a ger is, don't we? A ger is a stranger. Uh, it's translated here as his litigant. But we'll see in the Gemara next week that actually this ger, this word ger, uh, has some other translations, quite surprising uh, translations we'll see uh, when we get to that bit of the puzzle. But at the moment, we're going to now look uh, for the last few minutes of this shiur, on Shamoa ben Achechem. Listen between, uh, listen to the disputes between your, uh, between your brothers. Let me go back to the Gemara. Have you got the Gemara on the screen? Yeah, okay. So, Shamoa ben Achechem ushvatatem. Ama Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina now uh, throws his hat in the ring and he says, As hara levet din. As hara is, this is a, a, a warning. As hara means to be careful. You'll see that word uh, in modern Hebrew is used as well. As hara means a warning. Be careful. Levet din, it's a warning to the bet din. Shelo yishma divrei ba'al din. You should not listen to the words of one litigant. Kodem sheyavo baal din chaveiro. Until the other one arrives. In other words, you cannot listen to the evidence of one litigant in the absence of his opponent. And we learn that, Ravi Hanina learns that from this expression which we would just mean, understood, we would just understand to mean, listen carefully to the, 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 the evidence of your uh, litigants and judge between them. And he says, no, you've got to be careful about what you're uh, reading here. And he says, Shamoa bain achechen. What does the word bain mean? Between, between. between. So listen only when you are between your brothers, i.e. the litigants. How are you between them? Well, you have one on one side and you have one on the other side. You are between them. In other words, they're both there. So Rabbi Hanina is uh, a little bit uh, obsessional about looking at every single word. And he's looking at that little word bane there, which we might just ignore at a simple uh, level of reading the Pasuk. And he says, we learn a halacha out of this word. And this is classical Gemara. This is what Gemara is all about. Gemara is all about looking at the psukim in the Torah and learning halachot from the psukim. Sometimes it's dead obvious uh, what the posuk is telling us. And sometimes this little word comes along like Bain and we learn a halacha from it. Rabbi Hanina is teaching us that from this little word Bain, we learn that uh, a judge is forbidden to hear the evidence of one litigant if the other litigant, or his representative at least, is not there uh, um, uh, as well. Um, and um, the Steinsaltz uh, um, note over here uh, tells us this. Um, uh, a judge may not hear the account of one litigant in the absence of the other litigant. Uh, and we'll come on to the next bit in a minute. Uh, and of course, uh, why is that the case? Why, why shouldn't you hear the evidence of one while the other one is there? Well, the rabbis tell us that if somebody's going to lie, um, it's less likely they're going to lie in front of somebody who, who they know knows the truth. And I think that's, I think that's a psychological truth, actually. Uh, if you are, are going to tell a third party something that isn't true it's going to be more difficult to do that if the person standing next to the that third party knows the truth and you know that he knows the truth it's much easier to lie to a third party 
uh, uh, when there's nobody there that knows the truth. And that's what this uh, Gemara is telling us. That's what Rabbi Hanina is teaching us, that a judge must not listen to the evidence uh, of one person when the other litigant is not there. Uh, and it also goes on to say, Va'azhara Ba'al Din, I'm over here in where my marker is on the screen, and it's also a warning to the litigants themselves, Shelo Yatim Devarav Ladayan, Kodem Sheyavo Ba'al Din The litigant should not start to give his evidence until the other litigant is in, in place. Uh, if, 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 he, if he does do so, the judge must shut him up and say, you're not permitted to do this. Um, you're not permitted to uh, uh, um, give your evidence until the, your opponent has arrived. Now, how do we learn that? This is a warning to the judge. Shamoa. It's an, it's a, uh, it's a, an imperative. Um, you must listen. I, you, judges, must listen to the evidence bain achechem, between your brothers. In other words, when they're both there. How does Rabbi Hanina learn out uh, that a litigant is forbidden to do it? Maybe the litigant is allowed to do it, but the judge has an obligation not to listen. Uh, but no, we learn out from this pasuk uh, that the litigant also is forbidden. How do we do that? By a little bit of uh, Hebrew grammar. Um, because uh, the word... Shamoa uh, beinachechem mean is an imperative. Listen to your the evidence between your brothers, uh, but remember the Torah itself does not have any vowels in it. All we've got is the uh, word shin mem ayin, the letters shin mem ayin, um, and uh, it can be read instead of reading shamoa. It can be read as Shamea, Shin Mem Ayin. Here we've got a uh, Choram uh, 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 on the uh, Mem, so it goes Sha Mo A. But what if you had a Patach under the Sha Shin, it would be Sha, and you had a Chere under the Mem, it would be Sha Me A. But it would still be the same three letters, Shin Mem Ayin. Now, Sha Me A means make heard. It's, it's, it's not an imperative, you must listen. It's make heard. It's, uh, I, I can't remember the, how the, what the conju con conjugation is, uh, is called, but it means make heard. So it could, the pasuk could be read, shamea beinachechem. You must make your evidence heard between your brothers. In other words, you're not permitted to make your evidence heard. In other words, you're not permitted to give your evidence, except in a situation when your opponent is there. So Rabbi Hanina is not only darshaning this little word bain, he's darshaning the word shamoa and explaining to us that because the nekudot, the vowels, um, are not, as it were, set in stone, if you'll pardon the pun, um, that uh, uh, the, the, the Torah is only given to us with letters and not with the vowels, uh, there is a possibility to read that word not as shamoa, but shamea, uh, and therefore he learns out that not only is it forbidden for a judge to, to listen to evidence uh, uh, in the absence of both litigants, it is equally forbidden for a litigant to give his evidence uh, you'll say to me, what difference does it matter? The judge isn't listening. Well, it means he's done an Avera and he shouldn't do it. Uh, that's what Rabbi Hanania is telling us. Um, and remember, this is an Atzaveh. This is something that we have to be careful about. So, what does Shema mean, Johnny? Excuse me. Shema. 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 That's Shema the same is, word. Again, it's same letters. Imperative. It's an imperative. Listen. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exclamation. Shema. Here. Listen. Shema. Yeah. Listen. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So um, it could be that word as well, then. Yeah, could be. Okay. Shema, could be Shamea, could be Shamoa. We're not told. Uh, but in the context of Shema Yisrael, um, it's, an, it's, it's an exclamation. Shema Yisrael, listen, yeah. Israel. 
Okay, so um, let's stop there because uh, we're going to uh, uh, go over time and I said that we'd finished uh, um, promptly. Uh, we'll carry on next week, please God. Um, and uh, um, any uh, comments or, or questions, uh, you can send on the WhatsApp group of the Gomorrah and we can all uh, have a look at the questions and we can all try and answer them. Uh, so um, I'm going to call it a day. Uh, on here yeah. because we need to uh, we need people need to go and I need to go. Thank okay. you, Johnny. Right, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was By the way, that just before we go, just before we go, I'm going to send out uh, later on this morning. I'm going to send out a link to uh, the uh, Zoom Brit tomorrow morning. You are yeah. all uh, welcome to Zoom in tomorrow morning at. Uh, half past 10 Israel time, half past eight England time uh, to the Brit, please God, of my uh, newly born grandson. Uh, I'm going to send out a link. You are all welcome to join. I'm not going to say you're all invited because it is traditional not to invite people to come to a Brit. The reason being that uh, it is traditional that Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, attends every Brit. And if I were to invite you, then you would be obliged to come because it would be a chutzpah not to turn up if we have such a visitor such as Elio Navi. So it is traditional not to invite people to a Brit, but to inform them that a Brit will take place, please God. So a Brit will take place, please God, tomorrow at half past 10. A Zoom uh, link will be sent out. I'd like to thank you for inviting us to the program last night and thank you for participating. You're welcome. I'm going to. Um, it was excellent. Thank you. I'm going to send out a video um, of my bit as a trailer video for uh, the Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, I have to redo it because I made a muck of it um, uh, earlier on today. So I'm going to redo that right now. Okay. Good. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank Mazel you. Tov. Thank you. Mazel Tov. Thank you.